Any questions and answers? Few minutes we give for questions and answers. If you have now, which you are not going to ask in a personal interview, a general question. Yes, me. Ah, eh, eh, period hai. And dry meditation, he can do. Dry meditation is when you're getting nothing and there's no attraction inside. But once the attractive sounds, melodies, scenes start coming in, and especially when you can see your guru inside, it all changes. This dry period we all go through, but then we reach the right period where we see all the beautiful experiences. So you have to have patience during the dry period. But you can make it a little better by thinking of the Guru rest of the time. Pyaar kichche ga to anu. Haan, bilkul imagination on garna karo. Have a regular conversation. Udi tarah conversation karo. Sorry, with uh, using the Punjabi language, it uh, makes her feel better. Makes me feel better to get a chance to talk Punjabi with her. But others can, a little patience. Uh, but we're discussing uh, about the need for an experience inside to have the kind of love and devotion that we're talking about. And it is true that we need certain experiences, basic experiences, to really get carried away by that love and devotion. But before we get that, we have what is called a dry period when we just feel like we're struggling and we're not getting anything. But that seems to be a path that we have to go through because of our big distractions, mind is constantly pulling us out. We are trying to pull in. It looks like a struggle. That's a big subject of uh, our putting in our effort and banking on the grace of the Guru. And if you remind me, we'll talk about it later. Okay? How we match these two things. What is the role of our own effort and struggle in this path? And what is the role of the grace of a master coming in and helping us? And what's the distinction between the two? And so we'll talk about that. Okay? Yes. I have a question for you. Um, I really appreciate your speech and stuff. It makes me feel wonderful. But I'm, I'm wondering, in this world, this reality that we find ourselves in, what percentage of people are awake, would you say? In your opinion? Maybe about 10%. 10%? Is that enough to pull everybody else? Yes. Good. If, so, there, is, if there is one perfect living master, he can pull everybody. <laughs> but he follows a plan of the experiences generated here in which 10% are pulled back all the time. Because that's where I, I feel this sore, sorry, sorrowful for the, you know, for the separation that we all feel, you know? And I think uh, if, if there's hope for one, it should be, everybody should be included. Well, in this path, everybody is included. Yeah. Everybody is included. But supposing you want to take somebody somewhere and he says, wait, let me get some good time that I'm having here. You, you let him have a long rope to have the good time, don't you? Yeah. That's what's happening. People, people say, we like to stay here, not only here, even in the intermediate stages of experiences that we go towards our home, there are so many distractions. People are st stuck there too. And the masters say, okay, we'll wait. For masters, patience is natural. For us, it is not natural. <laughs> we are impatient people. We can be very impatient, but masters are patient. They can say, all right. You can take your time. For them, if you are a marked soul, it doesn't matter what you're doing, where you are, how much time you want. They allow you to have experiences, but they'll take you back home. They'll modify your thinking, your attitude accordingly. And at the end, you want nothing else but go home. It happens automatically. <laughs> yes. Um, yesterday, you spoke a little bit about dying while living, and uh, must we die while living to start our inner journey? And uh, 
Can you tell us a little bit more about the process? Do you have any tips or anything that would make our dying while living um, more efficient? The art of meditation is the art of dying while living. Dying while living means to have an experience while you're living in the human body, which you would have had anyway when you die in the physical body, which means to withdraw your attention from the body to the point in the brain behind the eyes, which happens automatically when we die. And you can have that experience created by meditation by putting your attention there. Gradually, stage by stage, you find that the attention is withdrawn first from the world and its activities, then from your body. And then you open up another door, the tenth door, which happens when you die. It also happens when you meditate successfully to that point. Once that happens, you open up a new world. And that's the same world that people who die get into. That world is like this world. It is not different. We, we have people there. People who died are also there. People who are living, they have their counterparts sitting there. That's the astral world. And in that world, we have a different life. And you find that the body with which you awaken to that life has a much longer life than this physical body. The normal lifespan of an astral body is from 1,000 to 3,000 physical years, 1,000 to 3,000 physical years pass and we have only one astral body which is reborn again and again during that period. But then the astral body also dies and then it moves into the causal body which is our mind. The mind is also like a body and the mind has a very big long life about 3 million physical years average. And so each of us are carrying the same mind for millions of years. The karma which we talk of is carried on the mind. So all previous events which we which create recycling of ourselves in rebirth are carried on the mind in that causal body. So these experiences take place when we die, either in the physical body, then we go to the astral. When we die in the astral body, we go to the causal. Then we die there, we recirculate again. We remain in these three worlds all the time. Uh, normal death does not take us beyond the astral world. Sometimes it takes us to the lower part of the astral world, which has two parts. The lower part we call the physico-astral overlap, which means that the same people who are here, we can see them when we die in disembodied spirit form. So when a person dies, he can see other people but the other people cannot see him because we only see the outside body. We can't see the disembodied form of a person. But that person can see. So we begin to, when they try to contact us and do anything, we call them ghosts and spirits. And there are two kinds of ghosts and spirits. We call them Bhut and Preet. In Hindi, in Punjabi, you know Bhut and Preet. Bhut is a disembodied spirit that moves, roams around because its desires were not fulfilled at one place and rushes around to see the different places where it wanted to go in the physical form and had a desire but could never go. The Preet is a fixed place. It haunts the place where it, it died. Most of the Preets are because of murders, accidents and so on. So those bodies, even when disembodied, they stay in that and watch that show they can't leave it very easily. These two are most common forms of spirits or disembodied forms of our life that roam around after death. We can get into that state even while living, by pulling our attention, our astral body moves around and can see all these things. If you go to the upper part of the astral plane, which is the first plane of the consciousness, if you go there, you can fly very freely in the whole of this created universe, which looks like a very small universe, you can go to the other galaxies. You can go and see other planets which exist in this form. Their questions are arising here, doubts are there, but you get direct access to those. You can fly there. You can also uh, fly into other, other hells, heavens created, all exist there. They actually exist in there. 
then you can have access and have those experiences. So there's great freedom to see more things. When you reach the beginning of the top astral plane, where you meet the form of your master who initiated you. And then you're together in a company which you like very much because that's a permanent friendship. Then you travel together everywhere. The master then gradually takes you from stage to stage. Every stage you think is such kind. Till the master tells, no, there is more. So he actually persuades you at every stage to move up because there is more. Each one looks so different like the origin of the rest. That it looks like it is the final one. But it's not the final one. All these experiences of which come after death to normal people, we can have while we are still living in the process of withdrawing attention behind the eyes. It's a good way to get it all done. Supposing you get the experience of dying while living, you will never be afraid of death after that. But you will know you really don't die. You just change your body. And you change your body into a lighter, better body. The astral body that we have, the suksham sharir, does not have any weight. You don't have to take any weight loss classes there. No, no gym to go to. It has the same form in which you die and the form can then change because you discover that this physical form you got was only one form that you took and you die with that form. If you are young, die. You carry a young face with you. Die old, you carry old face. Whatever your face here, you appear in the same face there. But then later on, you can change when you remember your past lives and so many faces you have and they can come up. Similarly, you can see your master's face in the same face you see it here. Then he can change to show you that he has been, supposing you are initiated in a past life, he can show you that form. He can also show you the form of his master and his master's master and the whole line of masters you can see at that stage. It's a, it's a remarkable experience. There is no comparison with that experience with any show we have here. It's the best show I can recommend to you. <laughs> you want to see the best possible show, go within and see it. There's nothing like it. And all that can be done through simple process of withdrawing attention to the eye center from the body and dying while living. That is dying while living. Okay? Yes? When somebody is dying in a lot of pain and they are taking a lot of morphine or anything, does that change the experience they are having of the dying process or the awareness of? The dying process can be very painful. Especially, it depends on how many attachments you have. The more attached you are to people and things, the more painful it becomes. It can also be painful physically because you don't want to leave the body and looks like we are being pulled out from the body. That's a painful experience. But if you have had the experience of dying while living, it's totally painless. And if you have a perfect living master who has initiated you, he appears even before you die and pulls you with his love in such a way at that time you forget everybody. Sometimes it can happen a few days before your death. Sometimes a week or a month before your death. And uh, I have seen, and some of you might have seen, that people who were following a perfect living master, that at the last time of their life, they become totally detached from everybody. And that detachment comes because the other pull is much stronger. And they also find the hollowness. Those who have meditated in their life and discovered this life after death, they have no problem at all. They wait. Master comes. They say, we are ready, waiting. He says, let's go. Death is as simple as that. So death has no fear. There is no fear of death at all for one who has practiced this meditation. Yes. Narcotics. The question Hain is asking is about narcotics. Painkillers, uh, opiate. Uh, painkillers, do they interfere with consciousness? Yeah, the painkillers that we take are for the body pain and they have no relationship with what happens to the disembodied spirit. It doesn't have any effect on that. The painkillers are only for the physical body. The astral body, the disembodied spirit that leaves us, it has no effect on that. Master G, I have two questions. I'm sorry, I lost the first one. 
the people with schizophrenia and psychotic cases, I guess they go through their karma and the soul is different from their mind. Like, you know, I have many patients on psychotic medications. So what happens in that case? Well, there can be many levels of karma, which can be good or bad. And some of the very heavy karma is where you cannot even meditate. You have these problems. And also, the karma is not necessarily only physical. There's a lot of emotional karma. There's mental karma. It affects the mind. So karma is in many forms. And therefore, one could be suffering mentally or suffering emotionally, suffering physically. They're all negative karma of different kinds. And sometimes it's a big obstruction for uh, either getting uh, on the spiritual path or even meditating. It does become an obstruction. It's a very heavy karma. We all pass through a lot of karma. And I think we must have some very good karma to come on the spiritual path. In, uh, in uh, one of the spiritual books, Guru Granth Sahib, it says, Kirt karam ke vichade kar kirpa me lo ram. That we have been separated by our bad karma for so long. Now give us an opportunity to get on the right track. So karma has prevented us from coming on the spiritual path. Actually, it's not only uh, that uh, karma can prevent people with that kind of bad karma. It's most of the people are so tied up with that kind of karma, they can't even think of coming on a spiritual path. To think of it, the spiritual path is, although we want to make it universal, like he says, everybody should have it. But the karma is such, their sanskars are such that they are trapped here. They can't even think of the spiritual path. They don't, not only they don't believe it, they don't have access to it. They can't think of it. Large population of living beings has no access at all. So it's a very small percentage of people with that good karma to be able to come on this. Within this good karma also, there are difficulties. Some have better advantage, some have not. Some have done a lot of work on the spiritual path in a past life. And they come here, their children, they are spiritually minded, they like to go there. And the great master, he initiated people as young. He gave half initiation to children as young as five and six years old. We all went to a hill station together. I was there with him. My father was there with him in Kalabagh mountain area and he saw a group of children there and uh, they said we want Nam, we want initiation. The small kids, if you see a book called The Glimpses of Great Master, you see pictures of that. I'll show you privately even on my iPhone I kept a copy of the picture of little children who are five years old and he says yes I'll give them Nam. Little children, he used to give what is called half initiation. He told them how to listen to the sound inside. Because many kids listen to the sounds anyway. It's so natural. And so it becomes very easy for them to practice the listening of the sound, which helps them later on. When those very kids used to become teenagers, he would call them back and give them the remaining meditation of repeating words and simran and so on. So then they got full initiation at that time. Those who were teenagers, to start with, he gave them Simran only sometimes, half initiation. And when they made some progress in meditation, he would give them the dhun or the shabad or the listening to the sound later on. So he, he felt that these people are marked. I remember when that group of 20 children were there, the secretaries who were accompanying him said, should we start chanti? Chanti means selection. Because there was selection, people would sit, he would call one by one a person and ask questions. Have you, you don't drink, you don't take meat, you follow some basic rules uh, of the game and therefore I can, merit, I can initiate you. Based on the answer, he would say, wait. He would say, you, you're ready. He would say, no, not yet ready. He would give some answer. And that selection, whoever he said, I accept, would then get initiated. And when those kids were produced before him, and the secretary said, should we start the selection? He said, they are already selected. And he initiated all of them. So, uh, this uh, ability 
to get initiation at a young age is generally not randomly done. It is because they have done work in a past life. Most of them are initiated in a past life. And during meditation, they discover their past life and their past masters. So it is not that uh, when a master looks at us, especially at the time of finding whether we are ready for initiation or not, he is not looking at us and our life as we know it. He is looking at a spectrum of lives. He has seen where we have come from for a long period of time. He sees where we stand in that growth and a spiritual evolution for a long period of time, maybe maybe thousand years, maybe several lifetimes. He looks at that, determines the time is right, it's time to go. So then he initiates. So many precocious children come and they have a past life experience with masters. Sometimes with the same master. They have died young and come back to get initiation again. Sometimes uh, people have asked me, who is our master who stays with us forever? We talk of the radiant form of a master because we can have successive masters in past lives or even in the same life. We can have more than one master. Who is the master who stays with us as a permanent friend till we reach home? It's always the last one after which we never take a human birth. That image and that master and that personality remains with us as a permanent friend forever. It's a very good, nicely arranged pattern. It's such a nice way of uh, escaping from this, this strange world of misery and pain and unhappiness. Basically, this world I see is a world of unhappiness. We have happy moments, pleasurable moments, painful moments. But overall, looks like we experience more suffering and unhappiness than we suffer play, pleasure and joy. We have both, combination of both. If our karma was such that we only had to have pain and suffering, we wouldn't be here. There are plenty of hells designed for that, go on suffering there. If our karma was so good that we had to have a good time all the time, we wouldn't be here either. There are so many heavens created for that purpose. Go and have a good time. Human life only comes when there's a combination of both. Then we have ups and downs combined. Then we become human. And it's a great combination. Because human life is when you can really find a perfect living master and go home. There are souls who are in higher regions right now who have gone through other processes, not through a perfect living master, but through masters who could take them to the astral or even causal plane. And they are stuck there. And they want to go further. And the only way they can go further is to come back as a human being, be reinitiated here as a human being and go up again. So therefore, the only opening that is left out to reach home is the human body, human life. Therefore, the best form of life. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me, is it better to be here or in the astral plane? I'll say here. They say, what kind of guy are you? Don't you think a higher level of consciousness is better? Well, for an experience, yes. But for going home, no. This is the place from where you go home. You don't have the free will there which you have here. You don't have the ignorance there which you have here. Mm -hmm. Thank God. <laughs> ignorance is bliss in that case. The, the, the beauty of uh, the ability to have a master in a human being is that the responsibility shifts to the master, which is very different from any other kind of teaching. If the master takes responsibility, and of course you have to verify by going to the radiant form, otherwise it's blind faith. Supposing a man tells you, I am a master and I am going to take you there. And you say, okay, and nothing happens. How do you know he was a master or not? Where is the proof? The biggest problem and with a doubting mind, for mind is a doubting mind, how will you make any progress at all? You have no idea at all. But you can give it a try. At least try what he says. If it doesn't work, you have to move on. 
and pray inside. I want a real master. I want a master who can give the commitment to take me home. This is a, this is a request, a, a kind of seeking, a kind of asking. I tell you, if you sit inside and ask for anything, you get it. Learn how to sit inside. That's the main thing. Don't ask with this mouth into this world. You can get all kinds of people around you. But ask there. Don't even speak. Let the master find you there. And appear in the physical world. Because you need a physical master in a physical body that you have and he has. So, it's, it's, it's a beautiful system. I, I can't uh, say too much about these things because it is overwhelming. Overwhelming how beautiful an experience is promised to us just by seeking insight. Don't stop seeking. Don't stop seeking even if you have a master. Say, I seek more. I want more. I met a, a girl in the early 80s when I was here, shifted to this country. And all her antashkaran was, I want more. She said, can you read what is written on my forehead? I said, I see the same word written on my forehead. I want more. I want more. I said, that should be standard for all seekers. We want more. We want more. We, we're not satisfied what we have. We want more. Master, give us more. God, give us more. Whoever the truth, give us more. We seek insight. And you will get it. There's a power in seeking and, and asking. But if you don't ask, then you must have such immense faith that you have discovered the perfect living master. Then you have tested him out. That whatever your questions were have been answered. Your intellect, your mind, the skeptic self has been satisfied and you want to move forward. When that stage comes, don't ask. You say, you know what I'm going to ask already and he will know it. Then you get everything without asking. But you must reach that stage. The stage by experience of that confidence that you can say, you already know. And you, he will prove to you he already knows. He'll prove it again and again that he already knows what you're going to ask. Yes. I wondered if you could comment on the value of um, being on the path. It seems one must learn a lot of patience. Or it feels to me like I need to be patient. Because... The work is not very fast. Where does the patience enter in? I agree entirely with you. <laughs> patience is very important on this path. Because when we get impatient, we get off the path. We divert ourselves. Patience is needed. And patience is a very great quality anyway. Patience is a great quality for living in this life. Patience is a great quality on the spiritual path. Because if we cannot wait, we lose. According to Herman Hess's book on the life of Buddha, Siddhartha, he says Buddha, after he went for enlightenment and came back into this world to live again, he wanted to find a job. And he went to a grocery store where they were selling vegetables and lentils and so on. And he said, I want the job. They said, have you had any experience? And Buddha said, no. I've never sold anything. He said, how can you do this job? He said, because I can think, I can wait, and I can fast. Anybody who can do these things can get anything done. Got the job. Wait was one of those things. But I have patience. So I agree, patience is very important because if we become impatient, then we may just miss when you're going to get something. Patience is good. Thank you. 